We are waiting on John Rose to do a test. I got to wake up a little bit. <laughs> Been a long day for me somehow. Very long day. Da da da. It's going to be a prototyping day today. <clears throat> Not a prototyping day, an ideation day. Different. Ideation and brainstorming. I'm excited to try this out. Class starts in seven minutes. If you're watching this after the fact, you can skip ahead. John Rose is going to be popping on any minute now. So we can do a little test. Make sure this all works. She's been watching your booty all <laughs> past two minutes. Lucky you. <laughs> Lucky you. I was just there. Yeah, I was looking for a charger. I found one. Okay. How you doing? I'm good. I'm tired. Ugh, I just got back from uh, East Coast, hanging out with my fam. Let's see. Okay. So you are now a co-host. Cool. Do you see on the bottom the breakout rooms button? No. Next to share screen, pause, stop recording. No, there's share screen, record, reactions, security participants. Ah, shit, you don't have the breakout rooms button? Uh. Fuck. Okay, I'm gonna try to make you host host and see if that does it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Boom. What about now? Now I have no powers. Oh, yeah. Tons. Okay. All right. I don't know how this works, so breakout rooms, assign. Yes. So we'll have to, is that a setting I can change in the future maybe? Um, we'll have to, if you need any like assistance, you can make me the host again and I will uh, fix it, which you just do by right clicking on my name or where it says more on my name. I'm hitting make host. Okay. Um, but so the breakout rooms, you can either automatically split it or we can put them into their teams and I can tell you who goes where. Um, and basically just tell it how many how many rooms you want to split it up into. Okay, and then can I bounce, I can bounce between those rooms somehow? Uh, yes, yeah, you can hit join on any of those rooms. Oh, that means that I'm gonna have, man, that sucks, hold on. Maybe I can fix this and we can restart the meeting real quick. Okay. Because it'll be frustrating if I can't do that too. Because I'm not gonna really be a part of any specific team. I'm just gonna be sort of observing. I see. Oh, let's see, meetings. Activator instructional days. Uh, edit this meeting. I can't edit this meeting. Is it because it's already started? Why can't I edit? What the hell?
Okay. There it is. All right, let's see here. Um, um, uh, and why don't you try like I don't know how to fucking do this. Why don't you try sharing your screen? Because it's similarly going to do that, right? Yeah, I was just going to do uh, the. But what, what's the best way to do it? You share your desktop. It depends on what you're trying to do. I usually just share the whole desktop, yeah, which is the leftmost option. And then if you have any audio that's going to come through, you have to make sure you hit share computer sound at the in the bottom left of that pop up window. Share sound. So one more to, I, I don't see it where? When you first hit share screen, it asks you what window you want to share. Yeah, share computer sound? Yes. But that's only if I'm playing stuff through the computer? Yeah, if you want to like play some music or a video or something. Okay, all I have is just my presentation here. Okay, that sounds so good. Did, are you seeing this? Yes. The art of prototyping. John Nelson Rose. That's you, I know you. <laughs> it's I. Okay, um, so there's probably people waiting to get in right now. Do you see participants? Yes. Okay, so I think you're gonna have to let them in. Let me uh, Zoom co-host can't make breakout rooms. Co-host controls the meeting. Uh, this might just be how we have to do it, which kind of sucks. So I guess like stick me in with one group and then switch me around here and there. Um, and I can talk you through how to do that and how to do that with other students. But why don't you go ahead and start letting people in. Cool. So from the participants list, just uh, pop anyone in who's in here. Where'd Zoom go? Hello! What's up, Vinayak? What's up, Gina? What's up, Matt? Hello. Hey, what's up? Hello, hello. Wow, gosh, so many people already. Y'all must be excited for this guy. Last time, John, I told them we were starting on time every time. So, yes. So it's 3.30. Uh, John is going to be largely controlling this one. I'm going to mostly just be a participant today because I want to also suck in the knowledge. Um, but I'll give you guys a little bit of an introduction. How many do we have here? 13? So we're missing a fair amount. John, if you'll just allow them in as you see them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be perfect. I had to make John the full host for today because Zoom. Uh, all right. So let me give a little bit of an introduction here. John uh, is actually one of my original mentors in the gaming world. Um, maybe one of my first besides like my brothers or something. One of my very first jobs in the space was working on Lumi Kids, which is an internal startup inside of Lumosity where we were making children's, children's educational games. And John was the head of games. Maybe there's some other title for that. I don't remember at Lumi Kids when I first started. And to be clear, this dude in my entire, you know, uh, professional experience at Lumosity, I feel like maybe half of the production games that Lumosity released were originally John's ideas. He's a very smart man. He makes really good games, and he's been working on games for pretty much his entire life. Um, yeah, what he is most brilliant at and originally inspired at Lumosity uh, was a whole section on creativity. He is incredibly talented at, yeah, coming up with awesome game ideas. So I, of course, decided to reach out to him, invite him here to talk to all of you. He's going to be covering ideation and prototyping, coming up with lots of awesome game ideas. So I think that's where I'll leave it for now. John, if you want to take over. Oh, that was a really sweet intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course. Um, hey, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm John. Um, happy to be here. Uh, I love talking about this type of stuff. Um, prototyping and incubation and all that stuff is kind of my favorite thing in the world. So, uh, And there's basically a lot of ways to do it wrong, and everybody finds a different way to do it wrong, I feel like, um, until you struggled through it and done it wrong a thousand times. So... Uh, I just kind of wanted to talk through uh, my steps that I've kind of collected over the years um, that we go through, try to structure the whole process of like engineering creativity, basically, and coming up with new game ideas, new feature ideas, 
and staying kind of agile in the uh, innovation space, as someone would put that. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about prototyping. So yeah, I will kind of describe what I did at Lumosity. Uh, just overall, I've been doing this for like 16 years. Um, I worked at, I've, I've had the pleasure of working at a bunch of studios, um, more than most uh, in that same amount of time because game industry is really kind of fluctuating and people get laid off all the time. So I've, I've gotten the chance to kind of go through it at a lot of different places. Um, here's some of, here are just some of the, uh, the types of games I've worked on. And I'm definitely not putting up this up here to brag because I haven't worked on a whole lot of like hits in my career. Um, but uh, I have had the pleasure of just working on a bunch of different titles, some of which were good, some of which were bad, but it's, it's kind of put me through the, uh, through the press of having to start a game up and seeing how, how the production process goes, seeing how the ideation process goes, and then, you know, putting it to bed and trying a completely different game. So I've collected a bunch of methods uh, throughout the years, kind of, there's, there's no one way to do all of this stuff, but um, I think there's a few things you, that everybody would agree you want to kind of keep your mind on. So the idea is I'll, I'll kind of go over my, my process um, and the stuff that I push for. Uh, sorry, let me let some more people in. The things that I push for in the incubation process and uh, yeah, what, what to look out for. So things I just want to go over. What, I'm, what I am covering is rapid prototyping, which is I'll get into in a second. Um, but it's all about the science. I call it the science of failing fast. Um, basically, if you, you, it's really easy to be on the wrong track and not know it until too late. So um, it's about finding out that you screwed up along the way and being able to kill that idea and move on to a better idea because there are infinite ideas out there. Um, yeah, and it's it's all about deciding what to make. This is the whole production process is about turning an idea into something real. Um, that's a whole other can of worms that takes most of the time, most of the money of a project. But this is about figuring out what you're going to do in the beginning because that's probably the most important part. Um, and it's all about generating these reliable and repeatable methods for generating new game ideas because it's it's relatively easy every now and then for someone to kind of stumble onto an intuitively good idea and make a game out of it, and they and they win and and then they can't, uh, they can't replicate that in their, in their next title. So we don't want that. We want to like learn how to engineer this process, engineer the fun into stuff. Um, and I'm not going to uh, go down the rabbit holes of how to design or code or art or play test. Um, those are all incredibly deep disciplines as you guys, I'm sure you guys know by now. But um, to be a great developer, which and a developer is someone who's like, just kind of gets everything, um, knows how to make something out of nothing. Um, that's that's what you really need to be in the in the very beginning of a project and then specialize out so kind of gloss over all of that stuff and just focus on the high level uh, yeah so what is rapid prototyping uh it's the quick development of a working but incomplete model which is used to prove this uh, suitability of a fully functional product which is a bunch of long ass words but really what it means is uh, making something small that's representative of something large. And you do that because the small thing is cheaper and faster to prove out than the big thing. Uh, that applies to a lot of different fields for sure, um, but none as much as games uh, because games are particularly well suited to making a small model that represents the large model. And games are also very expensive um, in the production process, but not in the replication process. So we need to really think about what we're doing when we're coming up with stuff in the beginning. Um, John, so, there may be more people uh, waiting to yeah, join oh, as well. I'm so bad at that. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> uh, cool. All right, yeah. So yeah, what is rapid prototyping? Uh, aside from that, sorry. Aside from that, um, the it, it, it builds upon like skills that, that every discipline needs in games, such as ideation, iteration, and and representative modeling, which is like just a long way of saying, make sure what, when you talk about something small and something that's um, prototypey, just try to keep in mind that it's, it needs to represent something bigger, something that you intend to build later. Um, it's easy to build something, get stuck um, proving out something that in the end you don't plan on building anyway, because you kind of forget what you're doing. So uh, it's always kind of keeping your eye on the, on, the, on the prize, on the goal, and using your imagination to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, just like at NASA, you know, they do this for uh, figuring out aerodynamics on a space shuttle on a tiny model. And in Hollywood, they storyboard things. 
to to just do a quick little sketch to to see how the, the total scene uh, structure works and how the beats all, all work together. So we're going to do an interactive demo. That's you always want to do is something as interactive as possible in games. And then you'll know that you're uh, closest to the mark when it comes to approving it or saying that it's not going to work. Uh. So yeah, uh, a lot of teams don't prototype at all. They kind of just go into building something. And uh, so this is a lot of philosophy and I just want to drill into you guys how important it is to do this stuff because people kind of forget. Uh, but the reason we do this is because we can, I'm going to say it's a lot, you can build anything. We can literally build anything we want. It's, it's not hard in this day and age with all the shared technology and smart people um, in our field. So, but what's worthwhile to build is the biggest question. And, and the reason uh, this is important is because design, and when I say design, I mean like figuring out what you're going to make from the art side, from the game design side, from the code side, that's incredibly expensive. And the reason game companies go out of business is because they don't think this through and they, and they pick the wrong bets and they end up uh, wasting a lot of money and time on something. So it's critical that you pick the right thing to make. Um, it works both with new game concepts and new features within an, exist in, within an existing game. Um, you should definitely prototype anything that's going to cost time and money to, to build out. One more person uh, waiting to join, John. Are you sure? Yes, I believe I'm not, so. I'm not seeing him on my thing. Tyler, you said you saw somebody, right? Caleb? Caleb uh, messaged me in the Discord saying he was waiting to join. OK, sorry about that. That's OK. Also, I neglected to do this, guys, but will somebody will somebody remind me right now what are our three core promises coming into this class every day? Have fun, play it all out, and celebrate. Hell yeah. OK, so we didn't really do this for John. John, thank you for being here. He's a very busy oh. man. He makes a lot of games. So before we move any forward, Let's pack some energy into this room. We've all agreed to play all out. We've all agreed to celebrate. We've all agreed to have fun. So let's give John a wonderful round of applause before we keep going, please. Yeah! Hey. Yeah, woo, woo, woo. Thanks for being here, John. You rule. OK, I'm going to shut Thank up now. Keep going. I, I, feel, I feel really good after that. Thank you. I never get this. This is, in the days of COVID, this is that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Appreciate it. Suck it all in, man. Yeah. I'll work with it. Internalize it. Um, yeah, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, we're just, I think, uh, kind of along with that, games, yeah, games are really unique in a lot of ways um, in the way that they're like tech and art and the way that they're uh, science and uh, design and, and all this stuff. But like, uh, we're really unique in um, that it's really hard to know if something is good until it's playable and interactive. Um, a lot of a lot of prototyping based industries don't really need to prototype as hard as we do because there's this there's a secret magic sauce in everything, which is interactability and the engagement that you get with interacting with something. So uh, it's really important that we kind of prototype more than than other industries and more than uh, than the next studio down the street um, because uh, the faster you figure out that there's a problem, the, the the better your game can be. And you make these little pivots, as they say, pivots. Um, at a at a root level, uh, they're really gonna pay dividends later on if you pay attention to this stuff in the beginning. So, well, I'm gonna keep harping on that. Uh, but, and and one reason for that is because they're so complex. Like, uh, th the amount of systems that you that go into like just a basic ass game are kind of insane from a from a coding perspective, from a design perspective, from everything. Uh, the amount of technology we build upon, um, it's systems interlocking with other systems that are um, a lot of the time just uh, unpredictable in, in their nature and that's the whole point. So uh, it's important that we think of that at, at a high level and always keep that in mind and realize that the unpredictability factor is what means we have to do this stuff in the beginning. Um, it's because it's just it's a rat's nest of like complication and but it's simultaneously supposed to feel really kind of easy on the players. So I just it's almost impossible what we do so I just I want to give us some credit for that. Um, we have to figure out what rules to include and which complexities to kind of push on somebody, but also pull back enough on so that it's usable. Um, yeah, so yeah, just keep that in mind when you're thinking about what, what about the unknown, like the unknown factors, what you should put into a game, what to, when you try to figure out what, what should be included. Um, it's basically, that's what risk is, is, is the unknown in, in our field. Uh, we have dev risk, which is like the special cost that, that we bear. It's expensive, it takes time, it takes resources, it takes passion uh to to feed into this machine that cranks out a game and like 
what if you what if you make the wrong game? What if you make just part of it the wrong game? Um, everything comes crashing down. So for us, it's always about turning kind of the the unknown into the known, and that's that's what de-risking is. And then from like a conceptual design standpoint, de-risking is prototyping. It's it's taking complicated ideas, making them real, making them tangible and playable, and then evaluating how people uh, mess with them. So uh, yeah, luckily we can make particularly representative models if we if we like keep our eyes on it, if we keep our mind into uh, if we if we want to make an adventure game, we you know you're not going to prototype some kind of shooter and then hope to be like wave your hands and smoke and mirrors and say you know, this will, this will somehow become this kind of game. Like you have to, you have to definitely keep your eyes on that, the whole process. So one, if we can do that, we can turn this big risk, all these question marks into concrete things that, and point to them and say, you know, this player B really got off on this one part of this game. And so you kind of upfront this cost and you think about exactly how a play tester is going to experience your prototype and try to account for that and, and take out the things that he's not going to notice so that you can, you can streamline this, the development of this prototype. Um, and that's what this whole process is all about turning the uh, unknown into into knowns if you can make good decisions uh yeah should i be taking questions during this or sure <laughs> yeah i mean if anybody has a question feel free to just scream it out at me yeah i think i want to emphasize one of your points there john i think like uh, universally i feel non-game developers underestimate how much effort it takes to build a game like games are actually one of the most complicated things you can build in the development world. Like, unless you're talking about, I don't know, hashing out cryptocurrency algorithms or something, like games are actually really, um, at least verbose, there's a lot to each individual element, even if those individual elements aren't particularly complicated, although some of them are. So uh, one of the things that John is talking about here is just taking the time to actually pick a game that's going to do really well so that you don't need to spend a bunch of time um, you don't need to waste a bunch of time building a game that's not going to be fun because games just take a lot of time. Yeah, and it's it's just it's really hard to watch a game fail. It has all this hype, it has all this beautiful art and these great systems, and you just you read about it for a year, and then it comes out and it just tanks because oh they didn't actually uh, test the the core of it. You know they put it in the hands of these players without putting it in the hands of play testers first. Yes. And Does anyone remember the number one killer of startups from last class? I remember the no, no money part. That's number two, yes. <laughs> What's number one, though? A product no one wants, was that it? Yeah, a product no one wants. It's the same thing here. It's a game that nobody wants. People will build something and spend so much effort building it, and then it's just like, it's not good. It's not what somebody wants to play. Yeah, definitely. And there's a mis misconception that people, uh, that studios will start uh, just cranking out production on a game that's just, they'll say it's like this other game, and you can just kind of clone a game, you know, take take what's out there and say, we're going to put our own little spin on it. Let's just get started. Um, very few games uh, succeed, relatively few games succeed uh, without being pretty unique in some meaningful way. Uh, we don't get that impression a lot of the time when we just think that, you know, Call of Duty just keeps coming out. But like, there's a reason Call of Duty keeps coming out and is a little different every time and that games that try to copy Call of Duty don't necessarily, you know, keep up. So they're putting a lot of effort and the, the best way to do it is in a way that's kind of hidden so that um, people, you make it look easy, you know, by, by getting the, the elementary important things right up front and then you just polish the details as you keep going on. So it's, it's an art of looking like, like oh shit, this, this is kind of easy to do. We know exactly what we're up to, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, they put a lot of effort, a lot of testing, a lot of what ifs and a lot of killing. You guys have heard the term killing your babies. It's my favorite term. And that's, you know, everybody gets attached to ideas. Um, the, sometimes the, the best and safest thing to do is just to, yeah, kill it when you realize it's just a little uglier than you need. So, yeah. And I'll definitely go more into that. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, and this may be a really, really kind of dumb question. Um, is there like any, like a good point in time to really consider, cause I see you have research there. Um, is there kind of a really good point in time to consider like, um, a kind of like a target market or like a particular play base that you're trying to like uh, consider when like designing. Um, I was just curious, I, I, I fumble that around with that a lot. Like I'm thinking it's like, oh, I thought about this group of people and like now I'm like, okay, now we've done this process and we're putting these 
particular uh, systems in place. I'm like, ah, this may be better for this type of crowd. Um, so I was just curious about that kind of thing. Yeah, totally. I think that stuff is really good to uh, keep in mind from the very beginning in this defining the main problem thing that I'm going to. I think that's that's the that's the big area. Your business, you have both like your business aims and then your your business constraints. Um, and they both they both need to be kept in lockstep with your development process and your design process and and the whole time we kind of like a lot of people think like all major features need to kind of go through a, a marketing eye um, you know you, so that a, a designer isn't just sitting there adding whatever the fuck he thinks is fun and then uh, it turns out you know that that actually no the business does this the market that we're going after you know that's way too hardcore for this particular market like where the money's coming from is not where the game is pointing at as far as engagement so um that's kind of keeping your prototyped uh questions down to like one or two questions like what are we trying to figure out um what what type of market are we trying to hit um in the very beginning and then you always keep pointing back to that true north of, of god all these business jargons are just flown out of my mouth and i can't stand myself this is not how i normally talk uh, but it actually we, works we like we like business in this room just, as, just okay. as much as we like games so it's okay well, yeah this just sounds disingenuous uh, but it, but it's, but it's true. Like, I think you're right. It's, it, it's easy to be in a big company and be a designer or a programmer and kind of hate the business side of people, the business people, because they're making decisions that don't line up with the fun. Um, but the two things run, uh, hold hands. And yeah, the biggest reason that I know the game studios go out of business because they run out of cash because people make the wrong game. And that's, that's the easiest way to make the wrong game is make something that some people find fun, but other people will pay for or nobody will pay for. So, yes. Um, I think Caleb is, is waiting to join now. Um, and something I, I, I'm sorry to, to jump in, John, here and there, but uh, something that I also think is important here, I at one point got told that I should wait to monetize uh, Mew and Me until I had 20,000 users. That was like the specific advice that somebody gave me because you know, you'll figure out how to make money if you have 20,000 20, users. That is stupid advice and don't follow it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, monetize uh, earlier rather than later because something that John is alluding to here is one way or another, you have to find the people who are going to pay for this product. And those are also the people that you should be listening to, the people who are willing to pay for your product. If you're listening to a bunch of people who aren't willing to pay for your product, you're going to create a product that nobody wants to pay for, right? And the whole conceit about prototyping is that somebody will like an early version of something if it's representative and good so that later on you can flesh it out. Um, the idea is that you don't have to make a full ass product and hope somebody likes it. You can make something that's small enough and simple enough, but they get it. And then you can, you can build on it from there. I'm not seeing any Caleb um, on this list still. So, okay. He was joining the wrong meeting I'm earlier. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, I was too excited Welcome. earlier. Click the wrong one. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All good. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any other questions before we jump into kind of uh, the, the steps outline here? Cool. Let me, uh, yeah, let me start at the most important here, which is defining the main problem. So uh, with every prototyping effort you make, you're going to want to be answering a single question. The question is usually something like, what kind of game, what kind of mobile game should I make? Or, um, you know, we have, we have a, a multiplayer game and, we, and we're, we're not, we're, people aren't uh, communicating in the game. Players aren't talking to each other in the game. What's a feature we can make that can make players talk to each other more? Or uh, this player, uh, this, this weapon needs to be nerfed or something like this weapon is killing too many people. How do we change this weapon so that it requires more, more player skill or something like that, right? You can, so you have this whole range of questions you can ask. But just try to narrow it down to one single question that you spend your cycles on answering because uh, it just makes everything much more clear and much more testable and easier to decide. Um, so uh, kind of to your question, this is where you would figure out, uh, usually you have a business concern in here that's like, that says we want to get into the free to play market your casual market, right? So that kind of limits your, your player market right there. Um, maybe you're, maybe you're deciding, uh, you come from a studio that's good at shooters and, and you have the skills to make a shooter. What kind of shooter should you make? Uh, this is kind of the very high level decision-making question that from which all things will, will attempt to answer and you can always point back to. So very critical. A lot of people miss this one step so they don't know when they're done. And that's, that's the biggest part of doing this, this particular step. Uh, when you come out of it, you should have a single question. 
all these steps have kind of a result that feeds into the next phase. And this one is, you should have a single question that can pr be proven out if you were to make a working example for it. So uh, one question would be, what kind of RPG should I make? Um, and then uh, the, the it, you should be able to develop a prototype RPG that, that answer the question, yeah, this thing's cool, this thing's doable or not. So uh, yeah, be, spend a lot of time on this step. It gets, it gets pretty easy. Again, business concerns are a big part of this. When we were at Lumosity, it was always like, what kind of brain game for mobile can we make that tests working memory and improves working memory, right? So that already cuts out a lot of possibilities. You know what to focus on. You know what you're gonna be testing against. So does that mean an example of this one for everybody here would be like, what game can we build in three months together? That kind of thing? Exactly true. Exactly true. And yeah, you may even have more. Is, I mean, is that, is that that's pretty much it? Is it for mobile or you're going to all platforms, that kind of thing? Yeah, I've been, I've been encouraging them to go mobile just because that's what I know best. So I'll be able to help them out on, but I haven't told them they have to. Um, uh -huh. And then otherwise, yeah, it's just the time constraint is the biggest thing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. So then this, this is kind of goes hand in hand with constraints, uh, which are you have one problem, but you can have many constraints, which kind of point the way and, 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 and put uh, stakes in the ground uh, the kind of wall in the, uh, the form of your final idea, which is which is the next step here, uh, stating your constraints. Uh, again, you have a lot of business constraints, you know, you have a certain amount of runway, um, you, you have tech constraints, like your programmers are probably versed in a certain engine, or you want this to go on a certain platform. So you're, you know, you're stuck with certain engines. Um, you have design constraints, like what have your designers done? How many tools do you have to build these things? Uh, how much time and effort do you have to put into designing things? Is it like gonna be a big systemic kind of game because that kind of runs on its own and you don't have to make a lot of content or is it gonna be a content heavy game that's like a narrative game or a choose your own adventure or yeah, choose your own adventure or like a, sorry, what am I thinking? Uh, pick and find an object game, I'm not losing that word. Anyway, I, an art heavy game or something like that. Uh, so all of these, all of these uh, constraints kind of uh, on your production cycle feed into what you can make and what, not only do they feed into what you can make, they, they feed into what you should make. So they're kind of like the real model in the world. They're, they're the facts. And identifying them early is how you don't run into walls later on. So really uh, you want as many constraints as you can find because the truth is you really do have a shit ton of constraints. You just, it's up to us to kind of point them out early. Um, ignoring them, it doesn't help anybody. And, and you guys have all heard that, uh, you know, there's no creativity without constraints. And that's, that's not only true, but it's like the more constraints you have, it's like you have 10 times the creativity because when you're creating something new, you have like your dreamer brain, which is like, oh, you know, I, I see these ideas in the clouds and I want to make this idea, ooh, this vision. Um, but, you know, that's only engaging part of your brain. But when you have constraints, you engage the problem solving part of your brain as well, which is this reptilian powerhouse thing that gets really excited about getting around constraints. So feed it the constraints. Uh, as, you, as you go through the process of prototype, you're going to find more constraints and you want to kind of feed those back in and, and, uh, and document them and share them out so that everybody knows. We might not know what we're doing, but we know what we're not doing as early as possible. So that when you come out of this, you have a good understanding of what is, what is set in stone. And when I say set in stone, like maybe later on you determine that a constraint isn't an actual real constraint, so you take it out, um, then it was never really a constraint. But, but as far as you know, these are things you can't do. These are the things that you have to do. Lock them down. Any question about constraints? Cool. Actually, I did yeah. want to ask. Um, I kind of understand tech, business, and art constraints. Mm -hmm. But what about design and production? I don't have an idea of how, like, what would be some of those constraints? Sure. So, like, a, design const a good design constraint would be that you don't have, like for designers to, uh, in most games for designers to really get their vision in, you have to have a lot of tools that lets their designs interface with the, with the programming. So like, if you don't have a good combat, if you don't have the capacity to make good level editing tools, for example, um, which is an expense and a cost and, and a very real thing for t in time, uh, then you don't wanna come up with a team-based uh, cover shooter game, for example, right? You say, you, if you can identify you have one or two designers, then they're gonna be probably working 
an overall systemic design, which doesn't have a lot of detail because they just, they don't have enough bandwidth to handle that. So that's, design is a lot about bandwidth. Um, they're also a lot about, you know, uh, communication. So if, if, if your programmers are on the other side of the world and they, you can't do a lot of communication very well, um, then their design is going to succeed better if it's in a more siloed kind of approach. And then, uh, which, which different games would, would require different kinds of communication with the rest of the team. Um, so those are kind of underlying, underlying production things. Um, as far as production itself, uh, it's like, what are your, what are your, what's your facility like? Can, can you, it's, it's the things that like you don't want to have to worry about, but in reality you kind of do. Uh, things like team dynamic, do you have a producer who can like push these things through or is everybody relying on each other to, to kind of be communicators because there's a lot of friction there. Um, just the team structure, the team uh, composition, do you have a shit ton of artists and just a couple programmers, then that's, you can make a better game in a certain way. If you, you'd make a better art heavy game with a, with a little bit of tech, if you have a bunch of artists and not many programmers. So things like that, things you don't want to have to think about, like in the perfect utopia of game development, but in reality, very much do. Does that kind of answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's constraints. Um, this is the part that no one likes and that's research. Um, because we can build anything and I'm going to keep saying that over and over again, but it's like, what do you want to build? Um, the thing that most people, no matter what, don't want to build is the game that's already out there doing the exact same thing you're trying to build because you'll always lose that fight pretty much every time. Um, so it's really important to dig in and look at what the competition is. Look what's happened before you, not just like two years ago, but like what happened five years ago in this space? Uh, you're making, if you're making a shooter now, you should look at what Half-Life did, even though Half-Life came out in the 90s, because it's th this, uh, the domino effect of influence is incredibly important in the, in the early designs of a game. So recognizing what came before and uh, seeing what decisions they made and kind of understanding their incubation practices as you're doing yours, um, that's kind of like that's kind of like pro level shit. I would say, like, as if you want to make the best games, you want to understand how people made them before you. Um, but I think that's really important. Uh, I think you should look not only into games, but you should look into apps that are kind of similar to your games that may that may kind of have similar features. Uh, you should look into movies that are coming out that are because narratively and visually they're gonna have a lot of crossover with with what you're doing and kind of will have the pulse of of what people are thinking, kind of the zeitgeist in the, in like that whole uh, nerd pop culture that, that we love, uh, you know, toys, all this stuff. It's toys, especially in, you know, in games, uh, architecture research, when you're talking about doing a, a shooter and you're a level designer, all this stuff, it, there should be a, a focused period of research where you're kind of just inundating yourself with what's, with what's been done so that you also know what, what not to do. If you're going to make a, a flying, game and you're into dragons, right? And and you're like, I'm gonna make a flying dragon. And then you realize that this game Lair came out like 10 years ago and completely crashed because people hated it. You have to figure out why. Um, and you wanna know that before you jump into it. So once you understand your constraints and kind of what question you're trying to ask, you should have some better understanding of what you wanna research, uh, which is, you know, it's pretty obvious. If, if someone tells you, you're gonna, you're gonna make a brain game about, you know, working memory, you know what to research, that one's easy. It gets a little harder when it's a little more nebulous, but if you want to make a shooter these days, you're going to be playing the Overwatches. You're going to be seeing how they do. You're going to see what they referenced, what tricks they do. Um, just so that when you go into actually coming up with your own shit, you, you have this background and you feel like you're standing on the shoulders of people who've done it before. So that one's pretty easy. Anyone have any questions about research? I have a question. Yeah. So um, for our three month long project, uh, what do you think is a good number of amount that say, you know, we at least have to research this amount of at least classic games in this genre to, you know, know at least know about, you know, what we're going to do, you know. Um, so like my, my basic point is this sounds like a thing that could be done on a, you know, large amount of, or can be done, you know, relatively little because there are so many games that you can look into and you know, just the time constraint thing, I guess, I guess again. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. As a, when you become kind of a, you know, when you're doing game development all the time, you start just kind of doing this stuff on the side anyway, you know, you, you become, 
if you're working on shooters all the time, you just start playing all the shooters. And then that just kind of adds up as you're making the game. And then the next next game you make, you're going to have this library of stuff you've played and, and it's helpful. Um, but, but now for the three month game, you guys are probably going to identify some, um, you know, some genre like a team based shooter, for example. I would just make a list of the things that are that are hot and popular, make a list of the things that unfortunately they make money, make a list of things that get critically. I think it's more important to get like cool. What are the things that like critically do really well and get noticed as from an indie perspective? Um, so a three month game, like I would look up like, you know, what Lucas, if you're, if you're into like puzzly type simulation stuff, I'd look up, you know, what Lucas Pope does and stuff like that. And, and just, just the, the guys that win the, uh, independent games or uh, festivals and stuff like that. Think, identify the market you're kind of working in and then figure out who's winning in there and just try to get the hits first and then work your way down the top 40. And then just so that everybody, when it's it's just a good communication device, especially too, when you're talking to another guy on your team and you're like, should we do a feature? Oh, you mean like in this game? Yes, like that game, because that's a hot game that is going to be uh, referential for you and important for you. So you're right, there's too many games to play, but focusing on kind of the hits is helpful in the beginning. Thank you, John. Cool, cool. Cool, and then so, you step out of this with a good understanding of what's out there, right? And then so before that, you you know what is set in stone and, and kind of what you want to answer. So once you have that, you can start coming up with ideas, which is everybody's favorite part. Um, ideation is kind of one of the most important parts, definitely. Uh, it's it's sometimes people just call it brainstorming. Brainstorming is part of it, um, but it's about writing down the possibilities, capturing the possibilities, what you can do. Um, you want definitely want to go for quantity over quality. Um, you want to sit in a group with um, multiple people if you can. You don't want to get to like, you know, I think 10, 15 people, you're kind of getting toward the top of, of people who can, of a group that can kind of, everybody can contribute equally and aren't getting squashed on because it's not only about getting a number of ideas out there on the board, it's about uh, everybody being heard, and people not stomping on each other and, and taking over. And that's really hard to do. We get this herd mentality of like, we're excited about our own ideas, but, and you stop kind of paying attention to other people's ideas. And so it's important to kind of get, limit yourself to a group like 10 or whatever that you can, you can all be heard, but you all represent different uh, perspectives and you all have different ideas. So get in a place, uh, it can be in Zoom, it can be in a, my favorite was just like always a conference room and you just write shit on the board. Um, you know, you've probably done that with post-it notes, put post-it notes on the board. Um, there's, you know, a thing called brain writing where everybody's, it's like a silent disco kind of version where everybody just writes stuff down and then shares their ideas at the end. Um, you can categorize those ideas if you want once, once they're all out and people can like share what their favorites were so you can find trends within the group. Um, but brainstorming and ideation itself is kind of its own, it's, it's a very deep rabbit hole of, of good ways to, to come up with ideas like this. And it's always about opening up communication, about keeping it positive um, and not stomping on things. You never want to tell someone like, no, that's a bad idea in ideation or brainstorming. You want to say, you know, people like say yes and. Um, so you want to be able to build on top of ideas. Some of the best brainstorming ideas is where someone comes up with something crazy and someone turns it into something even different, like makes a spin on it. And and when you find that moment of two people coming together to kind of make something that that neither would would have, it's it's a it's a beautiful feeling. It, it's kind of addicting. Uh, and it's this, and it's all about the, the divergence convergence uh, cycle. I don't know if you guys have talked about that much, but um, uh, when you're ideating, when you're coming up with something new that hasn't been done, when you're incubating, uh, there's this idea of of divergence and convergence, where divergence means you go wide with all of the possibilities. That's that's literally what brainstorming is, is pure divergence. All the ideas, all the quantity you can, and then you, um, convergence is the idea that all the ideas by themselves are kind of useless. Um, you need to identify which ones are gonna work and pull them back together. So that by coming up with a bunch, you can identify which ones are kind of in a bad zone or the zone that's not gonna work for you. And it lets you focus on the, on the slice that is gonna work and you pull them back into that slice. And then you can also brainstorm on that slice and you'll get a higher quality set of ideas because you know you're staying within that zone. And then further on, you, you pull those together and you realize within this slice, and we like this slice even more, um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be more fruitful. So that's the, that's kind of the uh, divergence convergence cycle that you always wanna, wanna be working on. 
the idea with idiot with uh, rapid iteration in an incubation setting is that you start with this huge panoply of ideas and over time you're not just coming up with more and more ideas you're you're hopefully honing in on something and if you keep repeating the cycle but you can't actually focus in on a final idea or set of ideas then then either the problem the main problem is like maybe wrong you don't have enough constraints um like something structural is wrong it's not necessarily your ideas but you just need to be kind of controlled a little more so but but here in the ideation process you don't need to worry about that you just want to you know shoot at the wall get a bunch of stuff on the wall and see what sticks and then trim it down later any questions about ideation and, and brainstorming cool uh yeah so you've let me i keep skipping over this part so you should come out of this with a huge list of possibilities right what do you do with that you identify the winners and the winners are a subset it's a short list of ideas and those are the ones that after discussing in a group, you realize everybody's excited probably most of the time about like maybe 25% of that huge set. It's usually smaller. People are into like five or 10% of, of what was out there. A lot of the stuff is just wacky. You realize it can't be made into a game, but maybe it'll spark something, right? So it was good to put it out there and brainstorming, but now you start to call and you say, this, this, this short list is not only a good set of ideas, but they're much more like I can see that they're going to take us somewhere. And that's really kind of invigorating when you can see that out of all the randomness, like this can point to a direction. So this is something we can build. So that's, that's what this discussion is about. You talk about the pros and cons about each one of these ideas that was out there. You start picking trends and circling the ones that, uh, that kind of go together. And then you realize that, oh yeah, there is like a, there's a trend here. There's, there's this area that I didn't see before that, that, that the shotgun blast of brainstorming kind of revealed. Um, and then, yeah, it's important at this step to start saying, yeah, these, this, these couple ideas, like they don't suck, but like, they're probably not good for right now. And if anything feels like you probably shouldn't do it right now, like I can maybe see it later or something. I don't really get it. Um, just say, screw it. You know, we're going to focus on the things that really feel good in this moment. Uh, so that's where you start picking these winners. Uh, you know, you can vote on the winners to, f there's a bunch of ways to take the big set and narrow it down. You can like vote, you can appoint stakeholders, um, which is something that's common, like someone, someone who's kind of representing the art side of things, someone who's representing, for example, at like a brain game place, someone who represents the neuroscience side of things, and they can kind of debate the different merits for as far as they see them for their disciplines. So they can say, you know, within these 10 ideas, I can really see how the science stands up. These other ones not so much, like that's important. If, if, if there are inviolable parts of the game, that need to that be need to be maintained then stakeholders are maybe a good idea um or you can just have like a commanding freaking decision maker type person a lot of the time like a ceo he's going to decide what he wants um and say i want these ideas because you know reason x y and z so there's a lot of reasons uh to try these different methods but in the end you just want your big ass list to come down to a short list of ideas to build cool any questions about that Cool. And this is where we finally get to uh, making something. And uh, so yeah, you have like too many ideas at this point. Um, but all it's been is a lot of like, wringing your brain and talking and arguing. And uh, it, t it took us if you'll notice to step six before we even start talking about making something real. And that's an important part of not wasting your time because building is the most uh, time exhausting, energy exhausting part of all of this. So at this point, your brain should be hurting and you don't want to talk to people anymore. All you want to do is like kind of make something. So uh, there's different ways to make a prototype. It can be digital, it can be paper, it can just be like logical, like with words. Um, obviously, if you start with something that's just like a word-based prototype, like a, like a, basically a, a long thought experiment. Um, that's the quickest thing to get done. You can, you can turn it into a paper prototype, which um, if you have a shooter even, you could like make a shooter using paper and moving the stuff around like a little board game. Um, you'll get at a lot of the issues that you're wondering about, but it won't ever be as like faithful as a digital prototype, which is what is like the, the cream of the crop, gold standard for, for prototyping. It depends how much time you have. It depends how much, um, 
expertise you have in like programming and stuff like that. So hopefully you can make it. I, I have a I have a question about that. If you don't mind us jumping in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to like, I would have assumed that like for a, for an FPS, like a paper prototype wouldn't be particularly useful. How do you like figure out if the game is a good idea in paper for something as mechanical and kinetic as an FPS? No, that's, that's a really good question. I think, uh, if you're going to make a call of duty clone, uh, digital is the only way to go because there's this, there's a spectrum of like pure conceptual to digital. And as you get closer along that spectrum to a digital thing, you start, you can replicate all, all of the parts, all of the elusive parts of a game concept. So once you make a digital prototype, you're getting the visceral feel, like you're saying, you're getting, um, you're getting the moment to moment uh, aesthetic neurokinetics that someone goes through, right? Um, if, you, if you just do a paper prototype, you're gonna answer questions that are more conceptual. Um, like, for example, you can show that this is how cover works, right? Or this is um, in situations like, you know, like a Hotline Miami thing, you could, you could show how it's all about planning from this, from this high level view. And like, maybe if, if that's the interesting part of your game, then it'll shine through at that moment. It depends. So it basically depends what you're trying to prove. And it all goes back to that main problem. If your main problem is a conceptual question, like, can I make a cool video game, uh, a cool shooter with, with time traveling mechanics. That's a conceptual question more so than a cool kinetic run around and shoot people in the face question. So you could more easily prove that on the side of the spectrum of talking about concepts with words and paper. But if you are just talking about, I want to make something that feels as good as Quake 3 Arena, um, then you need to, then you'll need to push it closer to the digital prototype. And then that's more risk. Um, because there's there's more unknowns in the things that uh, that take a little more finesse to build. Like you you know the movie and um, idea of something being high concept is something is high concept. A lot of people think high concept is like oh it's just it's like hard to grasp or something like that. But high concept means that the bare bones idea of me telling you something um, is is good enough to succeed based on the bare minimum. So like Jaws was. Jaws is high concept. It's that it's just a shark and he's loose on the beach. It doesn't matter how I really do that movie. It's like at the time it was very distinct for no one had ever really done that. And it's going to stand out because it's going to work like on a bare bones concept. And that's where you want to be. Ideally you, you can fuck it up less if there, if less can go wrong and less can go wrong if conceptually it's different and, and likely to succeed. So that's what high concept is. Sorry. So this is a lot, this is a lot in, in this one particular type of, of spectrum, but and can to I add to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. For instance, when we were picking our game for Delve Bros, um, we put out a, a a fair amount of Facebook split testing, and it was just a single image that said something. Um, so you know, it said like uh, a board game where an app acts as your DM, um, and even that was a valuable test because we got to compare it to a bunch of different things out there and see how people like clicked through on it. So I don't know if you would call that a paper prototype. You would probably just call that split testing, but that's still, even if you can just give somebody sort of a one-liner or an image, like some idea of what the game is going to be, you can still collect potentially useful information. Exactly true. Exactly true. So yeah, ideally you want to make something as representative as possible because then you, that's less risk in execution because you know you can do it. Um, but if you can also prove it out conceptually, that means you're also standing in a good place um, just as far as like a logical description of your game it'll probably succeed in the marketing sense. I'll probably understand in like a, in a general interest sense. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Try to do it digitally if you can. If not, just, you know, try to have something tangible if you can, because that, that gets rid of a lot of the questions and then you work your way down. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's really helpful. I think the high, whole high concept thing makes it make a lot more sense. Awesome, awesome, cool. Um, Cool. Let me just, I feel like I'm running out of time a little bit here, but so I'll try not to take forever. Um, yeah. So once, actually one more thing, let me, let me step back to this. There are a couple more things I want to talk about. Um, when you're doing, um, building a prototype, so pretend that we have enough time to do a digital prototype, just an ugly workable playable thing, right? Uh, you really want to make sure that you 
cut as many corners as possible and not um and, and you want to you want to focus on the things that the player will pick up and leave out the things that the player won't pick up because he doesn't know what work has gone into this right and any work you go into it could potentially be waste if he doesn't pick it up so or he or she doesn't pick it up so you want to to make a representative model so if you're making a shooter you want to make something that feels like a shooter um but that cuts all the fat of things that they won't perceive or that they won't find important. So that they, when they make their decision, if they like this prototype, it's based on the important stuff. So to do that, you're gonna make things ugly, as ugly as possible without screwing up their experience. You're gonna make, you're gonna code as ugly as possible without making it buggy and making it ruin their experience. Uh, you're gonna kick it out as fast as possible so that you can do as many iteration loops as possible. Um, so long as you don't make any mistakes that screw up the player experience. So it's a special skill of like keeping your eye on what's important for the player experience. And you kind of have to, no matter what your discipline is, when you're prototyping, you have to kind of be what they would call designery in like thinking about that player experience at all times so that you can, you can trim the fat and focus on what's needed. And then if anything fails, it's because those important building blocks have failed. So pick uh, an engine like that you're used to building stuff in fast. Um, hopefully everybody will kind of get a, get a tool set that they're fast with. You know, if it's a flash prototype, then do it in flash if you're good at flash. Unity, you know, is, is a great, or Unity and Unreal, and Unreal people are kind of used to working in that engine, then they can, they can kick things out fast. Uh, and that's the important part is just getting as many cycles down as possible of iteration. Even if it's ugly, you know, explain to your play tester, explain to people you're showing this to, yeah, it's ugly, but you kind of get the idea, right? And they'll be able to get into that mindset. Steal what you can from other games. You know, if, it's, if you can steal a model from online or art from online, just throw it in there because it kind of gets at what you're talking about, puts the focus on the important things. And then do it in a time box. So like you can build, you can riff on this stuff forever. You can make a, you can, oh, you know, I need another week for this prototype, but you know, don't put a, Put a specific line in the sand, say, we're going to do as much as possible until we hit this mark. When we hit this mark, hopefully the game works, someone can play it, and then we do another cycle on it. It's, it's important to get in this iterative idea instead of this waterfall garbage of just spend a bunch of time and kick it out over the wall because that's when things fail. You don't know if you've invested time in the right places when you do that. If you invest a little bit of time, test it, put a little bit of time, test it, then you know what, the, the, your, what, you're, uh, what you're doing, what you're focusing on. Uh, does that make sense too? All right. So when you're done with this, you've, you've uh, taken all of these ideas you made before and, uh, you know, focused on the ones, maybe you just picked one that you liked and you, and, uh, you, you kicked out a playable representative experience, uh, to help answer your main question. Is this the right game? Is this the right feature? Yada, yada, yada. And then what you do is you give it to somebody and watch them shit all over it because that's important. Um, and you pay attention to what they do and what they say, and you stay humble about it because it hurts. Uh, a lot of, a lot of game companies don't play test, but they, they're, they're starting to more, uh, the, the play testing is its whole field. Uh, user design research is, is a whole thing. There's ways to do it well, but basically it all comes down to giving what you have to somebody watching them screw with it, really paying attention to what they say and, and, and more importantly, what they do. Um, if you're talking about usability, you want to see where the pain points are. You want to see where the confusing points are. And you want to see what really kind of gets them off, what gets them excited. And what you, you can tell when someone's bored, you know, do they want to play it again? Do they skip this part of the game? Um, just take, just start logging notes. Don't make any generalizations yet. Don't make any judgments yet. Just, you know, write it all down. Uh, and don't lead them. Don't try to influence what they're doing at all. Try to be this like, uh, just observer as much as you possibly can. If they, if you have to do something to get them unblocked because they can't see the rest of the game, that's that's one thing. But, but really, just try to let them do it. And the more you let them do it, the more shitty it's going to make you look. So tell them, you know, tell them that it's not even your game. You're just testing it for somebody else. You know, uh, and just just watch what happens and uh, log it all so that you can talk about it later and uh, play devil's advocate like for them. So that like kind of turn against, this is the one point in time where you can kind of turn against your game and be like, oh, are you really that good? Um, because all the rest of it is about kind of defending your game and growing it in this like organically beautiful way. You know, this is me, this is us. Um, but now is where you shit on it. Now is where you beat it down and see if it can stand on its own two feet. And it usually won't because it's just a, it's just a prototype, but you can see like how you need to fix it, how you need to prop it up and make it tougher uh, the next go around because this is all about multiple uh, go arounds. Does that make sense? 
any questions? Cool. Um, and then, yeah, this is the last step of the loop. You've gone through, you've, you've made something, you've identified what you should make, you made it, you tested it with people, hopefully a bunch of people so that you don't have an N of one, you know, you have, you have quite a few opinions and hopefully they have trends and you get in with your, with your bros and you say, you know, what worked, you know, what was okay, what sucked. It's pretty obvious at this point, usually. Um, it's really easy for people's, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, vanity to be hurt in, in this situation uh, and to start hating on, and to start hating on the, uh, ah, to start hating on the participants say, oh, they just didn't get it or whatever. Uh, you know, they didn't pay attention. They're dumb. They don't play games enough. Uh, I've heard it all and it's painful to watch people do this to themselves because you're only hurting your own game and you're only hurting your own team. So try to understand where these people are coming from. Um, write down what the pain points were. Start theorizing about how to fix it. Um, what could be better about this UI that they didn't get before? What, why do these controls suck? You know, if there's a bug, don't, don't worry about the bug. The bug is, bugs are fixable, right? Don't get hung up on little things that weren't intended. Think about the things that were intended because those are the biggest risks. And when you're done with this step, everybody should be on the same page about what was working in the thing you built and what was not. All right, any questions about that? That's kind of the last I also thing. I also have a question about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, sort of the, one of the things with results, results, I think it's like, if you're doing sort of like A, B testing, it's, uh, it's helpful. But if you just have like one prototype, how do you tell if it's fun enough? Ooh, that's, that's a golden question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, I've, I've seen a couple different ways to do that. Sometimes people will, okay. So play testing A is normally about qualitative results versus quantitative results. Like, a-B tests are quantitative. You, you measure uh, numbers and you can say, uh, this threshold needs to hit this for this to be considered successful. If you're making a new prototype for a game, it's almost impossible to compare it to other shit that people have seen or that everyone in your group can talk about. So you really have to kind of have a gut intuition about this stuff. Um, and, and in the end, it's kind of about rating all of these different approaches. Hopefully you're gonna, you're gonna uh, prototype more than one thing or you're going to prototype several versions of the same thing and you can take these notes will help you decide what bubbles to the top relatively and then you can decide which one to make because in the end you're going to probably have to make something eventually this is a good way kind of for you to rate them and to to figure out ways to fix them and to identify what is working in one so that you can maybe cannibalize that for another approach as well so it's yeah it's less about hitting hitting a certain marker and more about being able to identify how good something is because you've asked one simple question and built something around that question and then these results will answer that question uh, with a little bit of intuition definitely hopefully as a game developer you, you start you making you start making games you can kind of start uh, from a gut level understanding what people respond to you don't know necessarily how it's going to do out in the wild, but you can tell that it, it's going to work better than this other one that you just tried. If I could give some advice, uh, I know that uh, I've done some testing before in the past, and I've always said just, uh, I've given the time limit of, this is the, like, the least amount of time I could, uh, it takes for someone to actually understand the product. Uh, and say like this is the minimum time you have to play yeah. and then don't say anything else and see how much longer or if they just are, look at the clock and be like oh the five minutes are up i'm out exactly. uh, that's generally how i've been able to tell like generally how much fun someone is having playing the games absolutely yeah and it and it, it depends on the, the game you're making honestly like if if you are making something like Florence, which is this narrative thing that needs to be really approachable. People have to understand both the narrative and how to play really quick. If you're talking about something like EVE Online, that needs to develop more importantly as like a long-term, it's, it's just a huge rat's nest of complexity and they don't care if you get it right away because they know that if you're gonna stick with it, you're gonna, there needs to be enough there to pull you in as an advanced user. So they just have, there's different things that you always want no matter what a game needs to be engaging, it needs to be somewhat accessible and usable, right? Um, so, you know, in the case of a brain game, it needs to be also effective. So you, you pay more attention. As a kid's game, it needs to be approachable and, and understandable more than any, anything else, no matter what. 
Um, so yeah, those, then you start making those heuristics is what you're talking about, drawing these lines and saying it needs to reach this or, or it sucks because we've done this enough times that we can identify when something is not hitting the mark. Yeah, and to say one last thing there, we're on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking about um, how to do some of those comparisons between ideas. So we'll also have a continuation of this conversation then. Okay. Awesome. So let me just kind of plug this back into, this was, this was just one loop of eight steps, okay? And then what you wanna do is realize that one, one loop is never enough. Um, you want to repeat what you've just done with the same results and see, and you'll notice that it changes the outcome. Uh, you go back to the main problem, you re kind of reevaluate all these steps as you do it. So once you've done a full pass of this, you see, you're making, you're making some shooter. Uh, you, you go back and say, is the problem still legit? Is this, do we still want to make a shooter given what we've seen? And usually it's yes. You know, there's big business concerns that haven't changed or whatever. And you're like, you're still excited to make a shooter. Did your constraints change? Do we realize that there's something that we can't really do? You, you know, you realize that in prototyping, it's going to take a lot of effort to make tactical squad behavior. You know, you thought maybe you'd do that. Can you right now just kind of cut that out and say, screw that, we're not going to do that. We're going to go for a more run and gun approach because we feel that no matter what we do, we're going to succeed better with that given our team. Um, <clears throat> usually uh, your results kind of uh, reveal different avenues you can go forward to fix these things, which means you might want to research more. Um, you might want to, re you were researching tactical shooters before, but now you want to do, you know, you want to go into Doom Eternal and, and see exactly what they're doing because there is no squad tactics in that. And you're like, oh, I, I see what I can do with this. Um, and then, yeah, you ideate, you, you'll come up with some of the same ideas, but you also come up with twists on those because you've gone through this process. And, and there's really something powerful about thinking really deeply about something and then walking away from it and letting it kind of crank in your subconscious for a couple of days. For some reason, like you're in the shower and that will just reveal winners like nobody business. Uh, so you want to do that as much as possible. And then when you build your, your next iteration, either it's a tweak of what you just did or you say, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, let's step back a little bit and change, let's pivot in this direction. Or you say, I'm going to do a completely different kind of shooter prototype and uh, hopefully when you play test the results of that you're getting closer results to what you were looking for um, as far as like was it a feature that you were trying to figure out to make people talk to each other more or were you just trying to come up with a with a shooter that is engaging or stuff like that so the second iteration and the third iteration is going to hone in on a better answer every time hopefully maybe not every single time but by doing this loop a bunch you'll in the end get closer to a good idea you'll You'll be because you'll be able to cut out things that you didn't know you didn't want to do, and you can say screw those things. We're not going to do this, and you can identify things that are nice to haves as you keep doing it. You say, you know, people are really responding to this double jump acrobatic kind of stuff that's in our prototype. It, we kind of just threw it in there as, as part of the process, but you know, we're kind of getting off on it because players are getting off on it. So let's maybe is that almost a constraint? Do you say, you know, let's this is something that we can really run with because it's not out there in the in the marketplace. So then you research, oh, there's, you know, the stuff that is similar to acrobatics, but isn't. So you can see how like every time you do this loop, it kind of changes from the last one you did before. And hopefully it takes you to the, you know, the promised land place that you were always intended to be with this prototype. Uh, and that's kind of how you do that. Just repeating the same steps over and over. Some people call it insanity, but it's legit. Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? And every time you, you uh, redo this loop, you also might skip some of these steps or spend very little time on them. Like you keep doing the loop, you'll realize, yeah, the main problem's fine. I'm going to skip that. Uh, I don't, there are constraints we get. Yeah, uh, I've done all the research. I've played every freaking game there is. So it's more about the ideation. And, I, and then maybe I've ideated enough. Maybe I'm just building a different thing every time. As long as you play test and discuss every time and, and spend time at the, at the core inner loop here at the bottom, uh, you'll be making progress. Any questions on that? Cool. This is, I'm sorry, this is taken, I wanted to do more workshop-y type stuff, but uh, this is, I'm almost done. I just wanted to talk about some best practices. Um, so different from steps, these are things that you always just want to be keeping uh, on the, in, at the back of your mind as you're doing all of these steps. And that's the three practices of staying in low fidelity, of removing obstacles, and staying focused. Uh, 
So low fidelity, are you guys familiar with, have you talked about that at all? Will, have you talked about like, you know, keep working ugly? Yeah. Not really, go ahead. Cool, so yeah, basically, you know, gray boxing, there's a bunch of terms for this in the, in the industry. There's a reason people work um, in really uh, limited detail stuff. That's what low fidelity is. High, high fidelity is what you released. Low fidelity is placeholder. And it basically lets you focus on the non-details. And if everything is non-detailed, then the things that are important jump out. If, if you add something that is super detailed, but then a nest of things that are non-detailed, that thing becomes the focus and it starts stealing attention and people start worrying about that. So basically you want to keep everything ugly so that your systems, so that your design decisions, so that the things that are actual risks are the things you're addressing because it's, it's a given that we can make a realistic world. It's a given that we can find the right textures for things or make a pretty jump animation, right? People have been doing this for 30 years where no one's really innovating on that. And that's not what we want to innovate probably. What we want to innovate is how do these systems work? What are our combat mechanics like probably? Keep everything ugly, keep everything kind of raw and those things stand out. And when we make decisions about the quality of a prototype, those decisions become about the important things. So the risk is that you have these assholes in business or who are at the administration, your company leadership, who don't really understand low fidelity because they, they've never made games um, and like they've never been in the uh, actual pipeline themselves. So they want to, they only want to judge things when they, when it's perfect. And you need to kind of promote this culture, this lo-fi culture, and keep everybody on the same page about why we're making this stuff ugly. And, it's, and, and explain to them that it's, it's so that we can make this stuff fast. It's so that when we judge it, we're judging it on the right things. Uh, it's not enough just to crank out ugly stuff. You have to get everybody on board at the, at the same time. And that's, that's what good incubation leadership is about, is kind of talking to all the other management and decision makers and keeping them on the same page that this is why we're doing this. Uh, so it, is, it is a culture, it is a paradigm uh, that you have to kind of maintain. Otherwise it falls apart and then it becomes this waterfall thing again, which is just, it's ugly. So yeah, stay low fidelity. Uh, yeah, and then removing obstacles is important. Uh, one reason prototypes fall apart is because people hit some snag and they can't get around it because you know that's a detail they can't, some bug they can't find or some algorithm they're trying to like get perfect or usually 99% of the time, it's a question that doesn't need to be solved. So identify the uh, things that are pitfalls and just move around them early. It's the science of avoiding those things. It's like something you, you learn um, because time is the enemy. Money is the enemy. The more you focus, the faster you do things, the uglier you do them, the quicker you'll just be much more agile in getting further down that obstacle course. Um, yeah, and just keep pulling back to the high level. Is this pointing to our main problem? Is this sticking to our criteria that we've laid out? And is, it, is this end product going to be representative of a game we want to build so that we're not okay in games that we don't actually intend to build in the end, which is easy to do. And the last uh, best practice is staying focused, is using time boxes. You never just crank on something until it's done. That's stupid. You always come up with an aggressive milestone even if you know you're not gonna hit it, everybody's on the same page, and then you fail to hit it, but you still have something, right? And then if it sucks, you add another milestone that everybody tries to hit. It's, you don't crunch to hit it or something, but like everybody's just trying to hit this one thing, be on the same page about the time so that no one um, is left behind. And you over communicate the whole time. If someone makes a change to the constraints, if someone has a cool idea, everybody needs to hear about it. So everybody's on the same page. Uh, it makes, and then everybody can make sure that everybody else is looking back at the main problem. Everybody's keeping an eye on the constraints. Everybody's working in the same direction. And then keep your prototypes representative again. It's easy to, this game I've been working on at work, we just, our prototype got greenlit, but it was a 2D game in portrait. And our real game is a 3D game in landscape. And like, that's a big disconnect. And so we have to, technical debt and design debt in order to make that leap all of a sudden. And you don't want to do that. You want to, when you get greenlit from a prototype, you want to push forward and not make huge changes. You just want to be like, yes, we, we're guaranteed we can do this. If we just add more time and effort, it'll get better. So keep them representative. Any questions there? <clears throat> How's
Um, cool. Do I have like 24 minutes? Is that right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. That, that went a lot faster last time I did this. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think I will, I will say, I think it's more important that the theory behind it all and, and the philosophy, not the theory, the philosophy of ask, of figuring this stuff out theoretically before you make anything, I think it's, it's critical and there's reasons why we do that. So, um, is there, uh, so I'll be able to put up the recording of this class, but can I also put up this deck as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, in the resources section, guys, you'll see that after this class, but you do still have 23 minutes, so. Okay, I can do this. Um, okay, so yeah, what I was gonna do is kind of just step through an ultra quick version of all of this um, with you guys and see how that goes. And, and uh, if, I feel like if you experience all the steps, um, yeah, it'll maybe answer any questions you have outstanding. And it's kind of fun anyway. Um, hopefully in the end, like your brain hurts a little bit and that's, that's the point, it feels good. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go through an example. Um, let's go through an example thing. We're gonna define a main problem and step through all this stuff. So actually, I'm gonna define a problem for you because I can. Uh, let's, let's come up with a little game. It's a small game. It's like say a four hour playtime game. You know one of those? Um, which I, I love these games that only take a little bit of time because the, there's not enough time in the world. Um, but so say it's a four hour game total and uh, four hours to play and it's in a dungeon. It's in a fantasy dungeon. Okay. That's your setting. So you can, you can imagine there's a lot of games out there that happen in dungeons and there's a lot of small games out there. Um, try to think of one that could fit in there. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was, I was planning to go into uh, breakout rooms and kind of figure, start jumping into, you know, what are ideas you could come up with, you know, just total concepts you could come up with for a four hour game that, that happens in a dungeon. Um, does anybody have any questions about the constraints? Everyone's seen a dungeon in a game before? Y'all good? Cool. Uh, Will? Yes. I was gonna do the breakout room thing. Yeah. You can, uh, uh, do you want them to be in their houses or do you want to just do random teams? Might be easiest to do just random. Random could be cool. Do it. So you can hit the breakout rooms button. It'll say auto assign and then you can pick how many rooms to create. So there's 20, 21 of us, I guess I'll be included in this, um, that will be split up. So however many people you want in each room. Okay, I don't have a breakout rooms button. Really? Uh, you might have to stop screen sharing. Okay. For that. Otherwise, you'll need to make me host again, and I'll do it. Well, there it is. Okay. Cool. How many rooms is that then? So, if I wanted like four or five people per room, uh, five rooms then. Cool. All right. So everybody, kind of go in there and um, let's just talk about you know start just talking to each other, maybe writing stuff down about possible, just throwing ideas out there for a small game that would happen in in a dungeon. And yes. um, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Just try to come up with the brand, most random shit ever and uh, we'll see what sticks, okay? Okay, um, and you can hit, I think you have to hit open rooms first from the breakout room button and you can join in your room individually by clicking on them yourself and hitting join. Sick technology, okay. I'll jump in there and see how you guys are doing. Okay. Right, here we go. How, how long do we have for this first exercise, John? Well, how about like five to six minutes? Five minutes, okay. Yeah. Just throw shit at the wall. What's and our see. goal? 10 games? 20 games? <laughs> no, like 50 games. Try to come 50 up with like games. 50 concepts. <laughs> Rack your brain. Five minutes of, of sprinting. You, you right. guys are creative, creative people. Okay. Okay, cool. Just to be clear, we're ignoring the like constraints other than your main problem and research stages, right? We're just doing ideation. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, just ideation, just, I was gonna do a research step, you're right, but yeah, just, if, if you guys can just come up with just, there's no, there's no resource constraints or anything, just small games you can think of that happen in a dungeon, that's all you gotta do. Yeah, so I think this is shaping up, just to um, say one last thing here, uh, this is shaping up, so I'm thinking on Wednesday, we'll go through John's process for our actual teams, and for the games we're actually gonna build over the next three months, so this can be our practice session. Cool, nice. Cool, all right, here we go. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Hi guys. Wow, it's like my favorite people. <laughs> All right, we have like no time. Uh, I guess let's just, 
Shoot out ideas. Who wants to go? Smashing tomatoes. You smash tomatoes in a dungeon. In yeah. a dungeon? Okay. <laughs> you said shoot ideas. You didn't say shoot logical ideas. That's true. He said any ideas. What's that? <laughs> Pea party. Pea party? Yeah. Like yeah. Tea. tea parties among zombies or something? Oh, tea party? Yeah. Ah, okay. I'm going to start writing these down. Tea party. Smashing potatoes. Smashing tomatoes. Smashing potatoes. Uh, you know. What about like a game where it's only the 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 like <laughs> what the hell they call the the part <laughs> you remember the claws in Skyrim the puzzles <laughs> that part oh. it's just like a dungeon with puzzles no monsters no fighting you just walk oh. in a dungeon okay we need uh, fifty four more all right escape room nurturing a garden oh. nurture it what. Nurturing a garden. A garden, a garden. Oh. And in a dungeon? It's Tyler's game in a dungeon. <laughs> How about like a NASCAR racing game in a dungeon? Ooh. Oh. But it's like beasts. NASCAR oh. racing. <laughs> that would be like a dungeon version of Mario Kart. In a dungeon. <laughs> dungeon Mario Kart. Cool. Okay, okay. It's a dungeon renovating game. A dungeon generating oh. game? Renovating. Oh, renovating. Oh, I love that. That's actually hysterical. You're like, it's like my, it's a uh, LA Cribs, but it's dungeons. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Pimpio Dungeon. Oh, uh, animals in the dungeon. Oh, okay. There's monsters or whatever. What about like, uh, you're, you're surviving nuclear holocaust in a dungeon? That's good. Dungeon bunker. Uh, some clear horror game stuff in here. Uh, you're a ghost hunter. Indiana Jones kind of games and stuff. What's that? Indiana Jones, uh, Lara Croft kind of games. Indiana Jones slash Lara Croft. What are some of that? So the constraints he gave us was specifically four hours. Is there anything that can be like time-based that makes this interesting? Something like that? Like I'm thinking Majora's Mask. You know, you're always on a timer. And that's kind of not true because you can go back in time. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, something like that. Maybe like, I mean, there, there's a bomb in the dungeon. <laughs> bomb diffuser. Well, yeah. <laughs> dungeon manager. Dungeon manager. Mm. Sex dungeon. Dungeon Hotel. Ah! Okay. That's something I thought I'd never hear. That's Dungeon fun. Hotel. That is cool. There was like the old game, there was a game at some point where you were, you played like the guy who made a dungeon and you were trying to kill adventurers. Does anyone remember what I'm talking about? No, yeah. that sounds awesome. <laughs> I don't remember the name of it. That was a while ago. I feel like it was a Flash game even. Anyway. That's great. Okay. Um, what are some unique elements of a dungeon that we could play around with? Darkness. Darkness. Um, dead, undead creatures. Ooh, okay. What about like, darkness is your enemy dungeon. Like somehow the thing that you're trying to accomplish is lighting up the dungeon. Yeah. <laughs> Elias has awe so easily. <laughs> <I do. laughs> <laughs> like half these ideas. The What's that? Shadows, shadows of the Damned. Uh -uh. That, that's, that's a game not. similar to where basically in the darkness you kind of lose health, but you're trying to light streets and stuff up to move forward. Okay, okay. What about like something like where you have to build your own structure to escape from the dungeon, but it has to be like something crazy like a boat. Or like, or like dungeon look, crafting. Rocket. Yeah, like a hot air balloon. Like go find your like resources for a goddamn hot air balloon. Okay, okay. Uh, dungeon dungeon camping? school. Dungeon camping. <laughs> oh, what about Are like um? Stuck in a dungeon. Stuck in a dungeon. I mean, kind yeah, of. Yeah, like but you're we'll trying to get out. 
okay. Somebody said escape room, but this is different. Oh, you're right. Yeah, how about how about a dungeon school for monsters or something? Ooh. Oh, so cute. Okay, what about uh, Jan? You're the janitor in a dungeon. <laughs> dungeon cleaner. <clears throat> um, I had a different idea, and I don't remember. Dungeon carving. Tell me more. Well, are you? There's those puzzles in which you can you can like design something or carve or like kind of like remodel something and are your way out of it. And if it's similar to what you want to do, then you win. Does that make sense? I did not make sense. Never Say mind. that again. Is it like the, it's like the Mario Party game where you have to like manipulate Mario's face, like that kind of thing? I just play, I played, I played this, I played crafting, this one game where you have to carve your way out of a dungeon, out of like a dark cave. And if oh. you carve the right pattern, you made it out. If you carve the wrong pattern, you kind of like died and fell in the ditch. That kind of stuck with me. That's weird. Okay, there are no bad ideas. Dungeon carving, it's on the list. With that kind of, um, I understood differently. So how about Dungeon Olympics? Like games which are kind <laughs> of center around the fact that they're in the dungeon. How do we have Aaliyah's right team? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, okay, I like this. Hmm. What about like you are the um, a professor or something in a dungeon? I'm hey, a dungeon. Yes. Cool. Cool. you're the you're whoever lives in the dungeon in Harry Potter. You're that person. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, I think everybody's come up with a lot of good ideas. How do I how do I end this thing? Where okay, so you may time? have to be out of here, but if you click on your breakout rooms button. In the bottom right, there should just be an end all rooms button. Breakout rooms, close all rooms? Yeah. So, okay, here we go. Ba 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 ba! Bye! <laughs> ha ha! So, they have a minute, so some people will be rushing to get a last couple of ideas in. Yeah, no, Dom, dude, I was really, uh, maybe I should wait to say this, but I was impressed. Like, everybody was coming up with a lot of weird ideas. It was cool. Yeah. I think one of our favorites, uh, let's see, dungeon manager. I don't remember who said it, but you're like a hotel clerk in a dungeon. <laughs> you're like the person, you're like the person, oh my God, I'm expanding the idea. You're like the person who like tells the prisoners where to go. Like they just bring you new prisoners and you're like, okay, well, uh, we gotta put them in cell lot four because the other ones are too full. Make sure everyone gets their food. Like it's it. the most benign job. Turning something evil and, and sadistic into something, yeah, yeah. Benefit, mundane. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Very yes. Cool. Yes. Is everybody back? How do you tell? You can, if you click on the, what? If you click on the breakout room button, yeah, you can see okay. whether people are back or not, and there will still be time left. It'll. Their names will be. I think this is everybody. The names will be like dark if they're still in the room, or it'll be grayed out yeah. if they're not. Well, I think everybody's everybody's back then. All right. Cool. Yeah, well, I was just telling Will, I think uh, that was really cool to see you guys just jump in there and like open up and have, have those ideas. Um, a lot of weird stuff, very cool. Uh, I just wanted to give a little, I wanted to step through ideally, like we're running out of time, but I wanted to step through kind of a play test version of a, uh, like a, a super lo-fi word prototype of all this, but I feel like we're kind of running out of time. So maybe I could just kind of go through, I kind of made one in, um, in anticipation of, of this problem. So uh, I can step through it here. But one, one way to do even, even less fidelity than a paper prototype is to do like what I call like a word prototype or a thought experiment prototype. And uh, that's just kind of where you kind of narrate. You, you, you sit and think about possibilities that someone, you could go to someone and be a system of, of possibilities and, and present them with this idea. And you kind of respond to what they say. And basically you just have to kind of think out the rule set and uh, and, and kind of react based on that. And then you can kind of, from a really high conceptual uh, layer, uh, see how they react kind of to the overall concept, but also do, you know, do these rules kind of make sense or is there dissonance there? So like, uh, I had this idea where like, you know, kind of like dungeon matchmaker, 
and, and you're like the new matchmaker in the dungeon and you just want people to be happy and like find their partner because they're all like really pissed off and, and depressed all the time. So you're a matchmaker and it's just kind of in these prototypes, it's important to just kind of know who, uh, who you are. Let me, I had a thing for this. Share my screen again. Work, work. Really? What's happening? You guys see this? Yes. I see discussing results. All right. So, yeah, cool. So before that, you build a word prototype, right? So basically, all you really care about who you are, where you are, what you can do, and what your goal is. That's like the most fundamental part, parts of a video game, right? So in my word prototype, you're a matchmaker. You can be whatever monster species you want. Um, you're in a dungeon. Uh, what you can do is basically third person. You can wander around. You can talk to people or you can attack people and get into fantasy fights with them, okay? But your goal is not violence. Your goal is to hook people up, okay? And uh, basically, no one wants to talk to you in this dungeon because everybody's pissed off and they're monsters. You kind of have to fight people just to get a word out of them, and that's okay. In this world, you fight people to have conversations with them. So you go up to the very start of the game. The first person you run into is this Cyclops. So um, say, I'll, I'll do this with Will just because I think you'd probably be a good player, play tester participant for this. I'm a Cyclops? Uh, you're, you're the player. Oh. You're the player and I'm the game, right? So in okay. the game, the game boots up, cutscene is you're in the dungeon. All you see in front of you is a Cyclops wow. girl. Okay. But you can either, you can either, and again, the things you can do are you can fight or you can talk to her. Okay. Uh, I talk to her. All right, you talk to her. She's really lonely and no one will talk to her and she can't oh. find the person she, she wants. Um, she's looking for a matchmaker and she's wondering if you could help her out. Okay, uh, yes, I can right. totally help you out, lonely Cyclops woman. And you ask her uh, what, what she's into and she's like, she, she's predictable, she's basic, but she likes you know Cyclops people with, with one eye. It's her thing, she can't get rid really of it. Really into it. <laughs> yeah. And so you're like, okay, that's it. That's the cutscene. So you go wander around. First thing you see is a skeleton. Yep. And you see a goblin with, with a scar across one of his eyes. Oh! All right. Okay. What do you do? Uh, I, I talk to the goblin. All right. The go goblin wants to fight you. Uh, what, what, I, what do I have at my disposal? You have a sword. It's too late. You're fighting now. Oh, okay. I stab right. him. There you go. So you stab him, you incapacitate him. That's how this game runs. So now you can talk. He talks to you. He okay. says he's lonely too. I'm like, are you into uh, taller women? He's totally into taller women. He's a goblin. Wow. Okay. Really uh, <laughs> how, and then you, how, how into eyes are you? What is what, on your value scale? Where are eyes? He's like, you know, I, I got one eye. I'm not, I don't have expectations that are, that are beyond what I got. All right. Okay. Seems like a match made in heaven. See? So this is what I like. Will can kind of understand <laughs> Where I'm obviously I'm kind of leading him with this stuff, but like he can kind of see where the game is going, right? That's always a good sign. That means that like this is stupid enough and simple enough to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so and then bada, bit, bada bing bada bing, you introduce the two. There's hearts. There's love. Who knows what they do? It's creepy. Uh, but you get points. You made a match, right? And then she introduces you to her sister, and her sister, another another cutscene is into creepy dudes like necromancers, but she doesn't know any- I had talked to the skeleton! There we go, see, there you go. So you can kind of see how one thing feeds into the other. That's what I was going for. Hmm. Again, I I'm like this a here. lot, um, actually. I haven't done word prototypes before, I haven't even heard of this, but this is a really fascinating, like even earlier step than paper prototyping even. Yeah. Um, and this is your example, Jeremy, of uh, you know, if you're gonna make an FPS game where you can reverse time or something, it's definitely hard to paper prototype that, but you could word prototype it and just gauge the level of enthusiasm or interest from people. Exactly, yeah, and like you said, it is kind of about enthusiasm. It, you can kind of identify, like you don't know what the fighting is gonna be like. You don't know what the, what the camera scheme is or anything, right? You don't really know how a lot of the mechanics work, but you can, you can focus unintentionally on the things that make it stand out. And those are the important things. So you can do basically 60 seconds of gameplay and kind of see what people are into and where it's broken at a super high level. Then you can break it down. Then you can go into a paper prototype if you feel good enough about this and then a real mm -hmm. prototype. Meredith so, yeah. just sent everybody a picture of Leela, by the way, during your example. Lee, ooh. From Futurama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Or, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking about. So if you guys can, so you guys actually saw that play test. Um, can you, because I'm super secure in my design abilities, can you guys kind of like weigh in on some problems with this game and things that like you could see as like a pain point or a usability point or something that I could have said earlier uh, to make it more understandable? Yeah. <clears throat> For one, you didn't specify if the Cyclops was a giant Cyclops or if she was a human sized one, just like for Rama. Totally. Uh, another one was, I would say not your fault, but Will's fault. Instead of saying to stab him, he could have said he disarmed him or he, you know, deflected him with his sword, but he went straight to stabbing. <laughs> yeah, Will's a violent dude and mm. he's got issues. But yeah, this, <laughs> but it is a good point. Like I, I didn't necessarily frame exactly when I said you could attack people. I didn't necessarily break that down into, you know, maybe maybe someone who's used to playing these games like wonders how what that actually means. You know, can you, is it more complicated than just attacking? So, yeah, maybe I need to like lead with you can either talk to people or you can do these two things, and so there wouldn't be any ambiguity there. I have two yeah. things that came to mind. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, the first one is I'd really like to understand what happens if you do decide to go for a fight route instead of the hookup route. Mm -hmm. And secondly, what is the player's motivation to hook up these monsters? I mean, sure, it's funny and stuff, but like, what's their overarching goal? That's what I would wonder. Good point. Very good point. Yeah, maybe it's not enough just to just to say you'll get points and you'll rack up totals of, of matches, right? You, mm -hmm. Some people want a more meaningful reason to be doing all this in the first place, or it's really not worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, yeah, you're right. Uh, what, yeah, what would happen if you did all the other stuff? That's, that's always interesting too, because you want to, hopefully my example, instead of just being those two things would have been like ex exposed a little bit more of the problems by letting, letting them do those, those different routes. And like people will naturally kind of try a bunch of different things in these play tests to kind of screw up the system. And that's a good thing. So uh, ideally I would have given him more time and more opportunities to kind of explore that. And then I could kind of put up the walls as he ran into the walls and then uh, he would better understand what he could do. Any other, uh, any other uh, improvements there, since we're running out of time? I was wondering what style of combat it is. Like, is it turn-based or hack and slash or, or what? That, that's a good question. I didn't even think about that. I, didn't even think, I don't know what would be better. See, this would be, then you guys could like, once you're talking about this and you're going through, did, did combat even work at all? And then you, you could talk about in your next brainstorming iteration, you would do this again and be like, did this actually work? Are people into matchmaking at all as you're going through this iteration process again? Can we put a constraint down that, yeah, we like matchmaking or screw matchmaking, that's dumb. Um, or when you actually, if you keep it, when you get into the building again, you kind of decide different permutations of what this combat would be. So that the next time you went through, you'd have few, you wouldn't be worrying about, should I do matchmaking? You're like, yeah, I'm down for now to do matchmaking, but Let's, let's, let's riff on the combat instead. So I don't want to steal everybody's time. I know we're kind of running out of it here, um, but if there are any questions, uh, I'm down. These, this is where you can reach me at John Nelson Rose at Gmail. I, uh, I have a little side project where I make my own games called Opium Play Online, and it's just a couple games on there now. But um, yeah, I like doing these talks and I'd like to do more of these and, and just kind of be involved in this scene more. So I don't know. It's really nice talking to everybody. And uh, John, I will invite you to the Discord immediately after this, so you can become, you can have a, a, a professor role on the Discord and hang out with them and watch what they're creating and give them feedback and everything like that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then like this email is out here for a reason. If, if you guys ever feel like you have questions about the incubation process, that's, I feel like I have run into a lot of stuff and I could maybe give alternative ideas about different ways you could approach things and stuff. Um, I'm way into that, um, so reach out to me at any time. But that's pretty much it. Any questions for John? Nothing? One question. Come on, people. It's OK. <laughs> hey, okay. John, do, yeah. do you have any uh, recommendations for you know when we're um, coming up with like the brainstorming session, is there any software that you've found useful like over Zoom, you know, to, to get our ideas in one place rather than sort of having them separately? Absolutely. Uh, I use a, a program called Muro, M-U-R-O, and that's basically like a distributed sticky, uh, sticky, what is it? Sticky notes? Sticky note board? Yeah. 
virtual whiteboard. And you can, you can scribble things together. And I mean, and even if you use, I've definitely used Google Sheets where you just get 20 people on the same Google, uh, Google spreadsheet and you can just kind of even communicate in real time that way. Um, but you're right, yeah, like if you use either one of those, it, getting the quantity is important there and it's, uh, and you can see everybody doing it in real time. So that's why they're really good. But yes. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. So let's say you made uh, like five digital prototypes for your upcoming project. Um, yeah. What would you do with the prototypes that you don't end up going with? Yeah, good question. I uh, definitely keep a repo of that stuff. Uh, usually, yeah, you'd identify two that you want to go forward to the next step with whatever, and then you document the other ones at, at like a high level. Um, especially like when we were doing uh, the Lumosity stuff, we would make, you know, different projects every couple of weeks. So the ones that didn't make it, you put them in a repo that everybody can uh, index really easily. You document what they were trying to solve, like what the main problems were, and like uh, put the playtesting notes in there, and just kind of the general discussion notes and what you learned along the process for each one, just at a high level. And then if, if, you, if they can be playable for people, that's the most important part. If you can point someone at a screen and say, this, this uh, particular game is what we looked into, they can play it, they can understand what you did. Uh, that could that could spark a thousand. I've seen that happen. Spark a thousand different games uh, later on, even when that thing is lying uh, dormant for a while. Someone also come in and riff on it and make a real thing. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon even at Lumosity for somebody to make an idea, not run with it, and then a few months later, somebody else to pick it up. Um, one of my, I think my last game there was uh, called Feel the Beat, which was our first rhythm game, and it was John's idea from the beginning that was like a year old or something that we had all known for a long time was a really interesting prototype and we finally picked up, you know, after a year, however long it was. Yeah, sometimes people just need need to see a different product with their own eyes to be able to be like, oh, I see where that could go. The important part in the documentation and in the sunsetting of these things is to just make them as approachable and understandable as possible from like a quick cursory read so that people don't have to get invested before they can see your, your idea. Any other questions for John? Um, I mean, there's no. I mean, I have a quick one. Uh, it's literally no. I believe this question, all right? But um, was there a particular game or particular thing that inspired you to become a good designer? Like, I feel like a lot of people, you know, they kind of go in this because they were like, "Oh, I this game totally inspired me to do um, become a developer." Uh, was there a game for you or particular media content that did that? That's a good question. You know, I, I have thought about this actually. Uh, I don't actually have a particular game. I just always knew when, since I was like six, that this was what I wanted. And I've actually designed them probably more than I've ever played them. I like, I like making them more than playing them. Even now I don't play that much and it's kind of weird, but, uh, yeah, I just, I like the problem solving process and I figured out that I would like that pretty soon. So, but I was like into the early Sega stuff. So like Sonic, Sonic two and, and the Jurassic park and all that stuff really kind of got my, got my head going in that direction. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so uh, John's email is here. I'm gonna nab this deck from him and put it up on a resources page as well as a recording of this once it's all processed and everything. But let's all thank John and give him a round of applause. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you guys. Fine. That was really fun. Thank you so much. And good luck. You guys have a lot of really cool people. I've seen the, the list and I've worked with some of them and they're yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> yes. Um, John, do you have any homework you want to assign them between now and Wednesday? Homework? Mm -hmm. I hate homework. Uh, <laughs> I would say, you know, just as like an exercise, uh, maybe one thing I, I like to do every now and then because I'm a weirdo is to look up a genre of game that I would never play. Like, uh, like I hate sports games, for example, and look, do research on the app store of like what's what's big in sports game, sports games, and uh, try to figure out if you can come up with a cool game that you would play based on that, um, based on what you see is doing well and, and their particular design decisions. Usually you can come up with some idea that like, oh, I could actually make basketball fun if I actually did this one thing. Mm. Again, that's just me. But I would, yeah, I like these thought experiments of turning something that you would normally find boring into something that you would play is probably one of the more valuable things that I try to do on a regular basis.
That's Thank awesome. You. Yeah, that's fantastic homework. Okay, so guys, we'll say that that's what uh, you're doing for Wednesday. Look up a category that you wouldn't normally play and do a brainstorming session around that, uh, where the constraints are, what's a game you would actually play in that category. Yeah. Um, so speaking of sports games, do you remember Sega Soccer Slam? Anybody? <laughs> I don't think I played that one. No. It's a GameCube soccer game where it was soccer, but really you just beat the crap out of everybody on the other team. And it was like yeah. the best thing ever. <laughs> like Road Rash made like, yeah. like Road Rash and Burnout made like yep. racing kind of fun for me. So like things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Okay, well, fantastic guys. So on Wednesday, we're gonna take John's process here and I'll run through it together. So you'll actually be um, prototyping and we'll, or, uh, we'll actually be iterating. What the hell am I saying? We'll be ideating, brainstorming, coming up with the game ideas. Um, the intention of next class will be to narrow down those ideas, come up with a certain number of them and then narrow them down to five for next week when we're actually gonna be paper prototyping, et cetera. So John, once again, thank you for showing up. Everybody else, thank you for showing up. We'll see y'all on Wednesday. Well, you guys take it easy. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.